Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, it is Sunday. I am home. What else is there to do except read some James Thurber? Why not? No one is watching. You got to read like nobody's watching you. Dance like you've never stood up. You got to laugh, laugh, laugh. Like I, I forget how all that goes. I forget how all that goes. Anyway, it's nice to be here. I love, no one is watching, but I've already got one like. Up to, I've got four thumbs up and hearts. And I don't understand how any of this works, ladies and gentlemen. I do not. But that's all right. I don't understand how a lot of things work in this world. I certainly don't, and I bet you don't either. Anyway, it's lovely to be here. It's lovely to have you watching us. And let's see. The Liberal Snowplowing Do-Gooder Fund beneficiary this week was uh, uh, Rockingham Entertainment Development. That is the 501c3 that I... Uh, Oh, if I click here, I might be able to see comments. Hi, Betty Sue. Hi, Terry Hanson. Hi, Catherine Fisher. Hi, very, very, very tall cousin. Hi, John Wilhelm. Anyway, um, let's see. What was I saying? Uh, Lord, my brain is fried, ladies and gentlemen. My brain is fried. Oh, Rocky M Entertainment Development. Yes, the Bellows Falls Opera House Project. Today I spent part, part of the reason my brain is fried is that today we were writing a grant proposal. Grant proposal, ladies and gentlemen, so local. The idea is, the idea is we've got a bunch of musicians here in the area ranging from singer-songwriters to instrumentalists to classical musicians. And we have every week at the Bellows Falls Opera House, we have a slideshow because local merchants are kind enough to support the Opera House by purchasing a slide. The slide shows for 15 seconds and it's on a half hour long loop. So it's about 10 minutes each time. So three times going through. And the music we use is just stock royalty free ambient music that you can find online. Well, why not? Why not commission our local musicians to do 10-minute instrumental pieces, use that as the bed for the music, and then they would get a slide, they would get a honor honorarium for composing the music, they would continue to own all the rights to it aside from our ability to use it in our slideshow, and they would get a slide each week announcing like shows they had coming up or music you could purchase online or whatever. Anyway, that's the idea. And so we are applying for a grant. And uh, I have to pay the person who is writing the grant application. So that is why we asked people to contribute this week. And I think we raised about $150. It's a little hard. It's a li Facebook. Faceplant is not our friend in being really easy to figure out how much money we are raising, but I think we're about 150 bucks, and I want a few people to thank. And the unidentified unglet is ready to thank them too. First off, down there in Bonville, Massachusetts, we is rebuilding this foot one metatarsal at a time. Mr. Gary Pierce, <coughs> out there in Missouri, Kansas, Missouri, our friend, the great artist, Catherine Fisher, <coughs> out there in Omaha, Nebraska, keeping Warren Buffett straight and narrow, Mr. John Wilhelm, <coughs> my own brother. My own brother, ladies and gentlemen, my own brother, he contributed. He contributed. He reached deep into his pocket and he came forth. He came forth with a gift, ladies and gentlemen. My own brother, the wonderful Will Hunter. 
out there in St. Louis, Missouri. She had friends visiting on the on the uh, Texas Eagle, the Texas Eagle train. She rides that without incident multiple times a year because she is wearing her slouchy Betty Sue T-shirt. She is wearing her slouchy Betty Sue T-shirt, but her friends who came to visit her on the Texas Eagle were not wearing slouchy Betty Sue T-shirts. And they arrive something like four hours and 56 minutes late. But out there in St. Louis, Missouri, the great Terry Hudson. <coughs> right here in Bellows Falls, Vermont, right here in Bellows Falls, Vermont, a man who spent more time more time in Facebook jail than the rest of us put together. He may not have a stent in his heart, but he's got a big, big heart. Mr. Rick Gabotsky. <coughs> My own partner in Roots on the Rail. She's just back from Cuba, ladies and gentlemen. She's just back from Cuba, where she fomented a revolution all her own. The great Sarah Ovenden. <coughs> We have someone, I don't know who it is, because Faceplant in its infinite wisdom only told me that someone donated, but they wouldn't say who. So Anonymous, Anonymous, thank you so much. <coughs> and ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if I've ever told you before, but I have a cousin. I have a cousin. He is as tall as the Gulf Oil building in the storied city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where he makes his home. He is as tall as the verniculars that rise up above from the lowest point on the Monahogahela River up to the highest point of Squirrel Hill. Indeed, my very, very, very tall cousin, Mr. Nat Hunter and his wonderful wife, Elise. <coughs> Thank you all so much. Thank you all so much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, tonight's reading is James Thurber's classic, The Night the Ghosts Got In. No, it is not The Night the Goats Got In. That's a different story, much more minor. This is The Night the Ghost Got In. Oh, look, <laughs> we've got Charlie Hunter's Reasonably Fine Art Talk showing up over in the corner. That really only is supposed to be there on Wednesdays. Oh, well. The ghost that got into our house on the night of November 17th, 1915, raised such a hullabaloo of misunderstandings that I am sorry that I did not let it just keep on walking and go to bed. Its advent caused my mother to throw a shoe through the window of the house next door and ended up with my grandfather shooting a patrolman. I am sorry, therefore, as I have said, that I ever paid any attention to the footsteps. They began at about a quarter past one o'clock in the morning, a rhythmic, quick cadence walking around the dining room table. My mother was asleep in one room upstairs, my brother Herman in another, Grandfather was in the attic on the old walnut bed, which, as you'll remember, one time fell on my father. I had just stepped out of the bathtub and was busily rubbing myself with the towel when I heard the steps. They were the steps of a man walking rapidly around the dining room table downstairs. The light from the bathroom shone down the back steps which dropped directly into the dining room. I could see the faint shine of plates on the plate rail. I could not see the table. The steps kept going round and round the table at regular intervals, a board creaked when it was trod upon. I supposed at first that it was my father or my brother Roy who had gone to Indianapolis, but they were expected home at any time. I suspected next but it was a burglar. It did not enter my mind until later that it was a ghost. After, after the walking had gone on for perhaps three minutes, I tiptoed to Herman's room. Psst, I hissed. 
in the dark, shaking him. Oh, he said in the low, hopeless tone of a despondent beagle. He always half suspected that something would get him during the night. I told him who I was. There's something downstairs, I said. He got up and followed me to the head of the back staircase. We listened together. There was no sound. The steps had ceased. Herman looked at me in some alarm. I had only, I had only the bath towel around my waist. He wanted to go back to bed, but I gripped his arm. There is something down there, I said. Instantly, the steps began again, circling the dining room table like a man running, and they started up the stairs toward us heavily, two at a time. The light still shone palely down the stairs. We saw nothing coming. We only heard the steps. Herman rushed to his room and slammed the door. I slammed shut the door at the stairs top and held my knee against it. After a long minute, I slowly opened it again. There was nothing there. There was no sound. Neither of us ever heard the ghost again. The slamming of the doors had aroused Mother. She peered out of her room. What on earth are you boys doing, she asked. Herman ventured out of his room. Nothing, he said roughly, but he was in color, a light green. What was all that running around downstairs, said Mother. So she had heard the steps too. We just looked at her. Burglars, she shouted intuitively. I tried to quiet her by staring lightly, by starting lightly downstairs. Come on, Herman, I said. I'll stay with mother, he said. She's all excited. I stepped back onto the landing. Don't either of you go a step, said mother. We'll call the police. Since the phone was downstairs, I did not see how we were going to call the police, nor did I really want the police. But mother made one of her quick, incomparable decisions. She flung up a window of her bedroom, which faced the bedroom windows of the house of a neighbor. She picked up a shoe and she whammed it through a pane of glass across the narrow space that separated the two houses. Glass tinkled into the bedroom, occupied by a retired engraver named Bodwell and his wife. Bodwell had been for some years in rather a bad way and was subject to mild attacks. Most everybody we knew or lived near had some kind of attacks. It was now about two o'clock of a moonless night. Clouds hung black and low. Bodwell was at the window in a minute, shouting, frothing a little, shaking his fist. We'll sell the house and go back to Peoria, we could hear Mrs. Bodwell saying. It was some time before Mother got through to Bodwell. Burglars, she shouted. Burglars in the house. Herman and I had not dared to tell her that it was not burglars, but ghosts. For she was even more afraid of ghosts than she was of burglars. Bodwell at first thought that she meant that there were burglars in his house. But finally, but finally, he quieted down and called the police for us over an extension phone by his bed. After he had disappeared from the window, Mother suddenly made as if to throw another shoe, not because there was further need of it, but, as she later explained, because the thrill of heaving a shoe through a window had enormously taken her fancy. I prevented her. The police were on hand in a commendably short time. A Ford sedan full of them, two on motorcycles, and a patrol wagon with about eight in it, and a few reporters. 
They began banging at our front door. Flashlights shone streaks of gleam up and down the walls, across the yard, down the walk between our house and Bodwell's. Open up, cried a hoarse voice. We're men from headquarters. I wanted to go down and let them in since there they were, but mother would not hear of it. You'd catch your death. You haven't a stitch on, she pointed out. I wound the towel around me again. Finally, the cops put their shoulders to our big, heavy front door with its thick, beveled glass, and they broke it in. I could hear a rending of wood and a splash of glass on the floor of the hall. Their lights played all over the living room and crisscrossed nervously in the dining room, stabbed into hallways, shot up the front stairs, and finally up the back. They caught me standing in my towel at the top. A heavy policeman bounded up the steps. Who are you? he demanded. I, I live here, I said. Well, what's the matter? Are you hot? He asked. It was, as a matter of fact, cold. I went to my room and I pulled on some trousers. On my way out, a cop stuck a gun into my ribs. What are you doing here? He demanded. I live here, I said. The officer in charge reported to mother, no sign of nobody, lady. Must have got away. What did he look like? There were two or three of them, my mother said, whooping and carrying on and slamming doors. Now, that's funny, said the cop. All your windows and doors was locked on the inside, tight as a tick. Downstairs, we could hear the tromping of the other police officers. Police were all over the place. Doors were yanked open. Drawers were yanked open. Windows were shot up and pulled down. Furniture fell with dull thumps. A half dozen policemen emerged out of the darkness of the front hallway upstairs. They began to ransack the floor. They pulled beds away from the walls. They tore clothes off the hooks. They pulled suitcases and boxes off shelves in the closet. One of them found an old zither that Roy had won in a pool tournament. Now look at here, Joe, he said, strumming it with a big paw. The cop named Joe took it and turned it over. What is it, he asked me. It's an old zither our guinea pig used to sleep on, I said. It was true. We had a pet guinea pig that would never sleep anywhere at one time except on that zither. But I should never have said so. Joe and the other cop looked at me for a long time. They put the zither back on a shelf. No sign of nothing, said the cop who had first spoken to mother. This guy, he explained to the others, jerking the thumb at me, was naked. The lady seems historical. They all nodded but said nothing. They just looked at me. In the small silence, we all heard a creaking in the attic. Grandfather was turning over in bed. What's that? snapped Joe. Five or six cops sprang for the attic door before I could intervene or explain. I realized it would be bad if they burst in on grandfather unannounced or even announced. He was going through a phase in which he believed that General Meade's men, under steady hammering from Stonewall Jackson, were beginning to retreat and even desert. When I got to the attic, things were pretty confused. Grandfather had evidently jumped to the... Grandfather had evidently jumped to the conclusion that the police were deserters from Meade's army, trying to hide away in his attic. He bounded out of bed wearing a long flannel nightgown over long woolen underwear, a nightcap, 
and a leather jacket around his chest. The cops must have realized at once the, that the indignant old white-haired gentleman belonged in the house, but they had no chance to say so. Back, ye cowardly dogs, roared grandfather. Back to the lines, ye goddamn lily-livered cattle. With that, he fetched the officer who found the zither a flat-handed smack alongside his head that sent him sprawling. The others beat a retreat, but not fast enough. Grandfather grabbed Zither's gun from its holster and let fly. The report seemed to crack the rafters. Smoke filled the attic. The cop cursed and shot his hand to his shoulder. Somehow, we all finally got downstairs again and locked the door against the old gentleman. He fired once or twice more in the darkness, and then he went back to bed. That was grandfather, I said to Joe, out of breath. He thinks you're deserters. I'll say he does, said Joe. The cops were reluctant to leave without getting their hands on somebody besides grandfather. The night had been distinctly a defeat for them. Furthermore, they obviously didn't like the layout. Something looked, and I can see their viewpoint, kind of phony. They began to poke into things again. A reporter, a thin-faced, wispy man, came up to me. I had put on one of Mother's blouses, not being able to find anything else. The reporter looked at me with mingled suspicion and interest. Just what the hell is the real lowdown here, bud? He asked. I decided to be frank with him. We had ghosts, I said. He gazed at me. Of, he gazed at me for a long time as if I were a slot machine, into which he had, without results, dropped a nickel. Then he walked away. The cops followed him, the one grandfather had shot, holding his now, bandaged, his now bandaged arm, cursing and blaspheming. I'm going to get my gun back from that old bird, said the zither cop. Yeah, said Joe. You and who else? I told them I'd bring it to the station house the next day. What was that? What was the matter with that one policeman? Other mother asked the next morning after they'd gone. Grandfather shot him, I said. What for? She demanded. I told her that he was a deserter. Of all things, said mother, he seemed like such a nice looking young man. Grandfather was fresh as a daisy and full of jokes the next morning. We thought at first he had forgotten all about what had happened, but he hadn't. Over his third cup of coffee, he glared at Herman and me. What was the idea of all them cops? Terry hooting around the house last night, he asked. He had us there. All right, ladies and gentlemen, all right. Well, we can be Thankful in our white privilege that uh, cops showed up at James Thurber's house. His grandfather shot one of them, and they all made it out of that all right. We are lucky bugs. We are lucky bugs. All right. We'll see you next week, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you next week for the next chapter of My Life in Hard Times, which is More Alarms at Night. Perth Amboy, ladies and gentlemen, Perth Amboy. We'll see you then. You take good care.